Hirtelen lesz az éjszakát. Úgy Molly had the most beautiful speaking voice of all Hungarian women I've ever met. And she had an elegance of a aristocratic lady and we knew that she comes from a very small village and uh, her father is the uh, headmaster of the school and uh, she went to um, she was very musical so she was uh, taught to uh, sing and became the Hungarian Marlene Dietrich. Now she wasn't a singer of a kind of pop songs, she was definitely a chanson singer and also a very good actor. I hope you will see snippets of uh, Molly acting and singing and you will hear her speaking voice. And I had the good luck to be friend of the family until the very end because um, they came out in 56 as well. And then we became colleagues again with Peter at Radio Free Europe in Munich and London. And I met Molly quite a few times here in London and also in Munich. And you as a grown-up, when <coughs> Monica was just thinking of what to do with her life, should she become an actress, an American actress, or a journalist? We had great discussions about it, and in the end, uh, I don't know whether you, get, you regret that you didn't become an actress. No, no. <laughs> but, uh, so we'll have a little discussion. It will last about 40 minutes. And we concentrate on 1944. I mean, uh, this is the anniversary year of the Holocaust. So we will, of course, remember Bali as an actress and the chanson singer, but also as someone who saved the life uh, very bravely of um, about a dozen uh, people. Jews whom she was hiding in her house. But uh, let's sort of go back to the beginning. Um, yeah, she went to study music um, and uh, was very fortunate she had some mentors uh, who were very interested in helping her. Um, and so it wasn't long before she was asked to appear in movies, obviously because she looked very good. And so she, could, she looked good and she could sing, so she started to act in movies, I think, very soon after she finished um, um, the, the Academy. And um, she, she usually sang in her movie roles, it usually involved her singing. Um, so she either played a singer, you know, a nightclub singer or something like that. Um, and um, so that's how her, her career kicked off. <laughs> where there were little afternoon concerts. This was called the Hongri, and Voli Ratz was the attraction. She sang to the people who were sitting, eating fantastic cakes and kremes and dobostorta, and listening to a wonderful Hungarian Marlene Dietrich singing clever chansons written by uh, famous writers and good composers. Um, and uh, she was very choosy of what to sing. Uh, that was the Hongli. And this wonderful peacetime, um, romantic and ideal setup came to a sudden end in 1944, mm -hmm. when on the 19th of March, the uh, German army occupied Hungary. And uh, the Jews who were already um, in the fix and then uh, uh, have been um, coming under all sorts of laws, losing their jobs, 
My father was for 30 years the literary editor of the largest Hungarian publishing company, the Athenian, was from one day to, to the other sort of um, asked to leave. And uh, Vali, I think, first thought of helping her close friends who happened to be Jewish. No? That was the idea. I mean, it's all described in your book very well. Mm. Yeah, I mean, she, um, she knew very many Jewish people. Um, they were her colleagues, um, they were friends, um, they were people that she, she worked with, they were people in the music business, the film business, the um, theater. Um, so when the Germans came in and suddenly they were in very great danger, um, a few of them went to her to ask her whether she might be able to help in some way. Um, so she had to think very carefully about it, but um, in the end she devised a very clever uh, way in which she could, um, she could help a, a handful of her friends. Um, she had a, a sort of secret compartment built into the wardrobe in her bedroom. It was, very, it was a very big wardrobe. It was built to actually accommodate her stage dresses, so it was like much bigger than the, the usual size. <coughs> And so she had a false wall put into it, and behind that, um, people would be able to um, to hide if, in the event of you know a police raid or something like that um, happening. Um, so once she realized that there was some uh, way in which perhaps she could safely uh, help them, um, she then took in um, a handful of people, five or six people, and. Um, yeah, so pretty much um, throughout the whole duration of the um, Nazi occupation, which went on for eight or nine months, um, they were there. But uh, at one point she got into trouble for some reason or another. Yes. Um, okay, probably you have to read the book if <laughs> you want to know all the intricate, um, the twists and turns, um, because quite extraordinary things were happening to her, but um, in, in order to, to feel that, um, to, to deflect any suspicion that she might perhaps be harboring Jews, she thought it was quite a, quite a good idea to be seen outwardly, to be fraternizing with the Germans. So uh, some you know, Wehrmacht officers would uh, take her out, you know, they'd come with their, you know, with their army uh, jeep and stop in front of the villa and uh, pick her up and take her out for dinner and that sort of thing. So she was seen to be to be to be friendly with them. And this was a this was a uh, a very good strategy for um, deflecting any kind of suspicion that you know she, she might be doing what, what she was actually doing, which is just harboring Jews in her basement. Um, and, and that worked. Um, but you know at, at, at some point later on in her story that was to um, that was to then get her into a great deal of trouble. Uh, actually, she thought of it, and uh, one sort of uh, mild way of um, getting along with the occupiers was to give concerts to the soldiers who were on leave from the front, like Berlin, or sort of sing for the soldiers. And she's done these concerts to. Um, army officers and some Germans sat in, listened to it, enjoying it. And after the war, she was in trouble with this. Ah, Wally Rath, the one who gave free concerts to the um, Wehrmacht officers sitting there, clapping and, and enjoying themselves. And uh, all the time, she was um, doing a very brave thing because uh, if she was found out hiding Jews. She was immediately uh, to be arrested or even well, she taken was, to yeah, Auschwitz. She was arrested because uh, inadvertently um, she was uh, she was betrayed by the, the husband of one of the the women who was um, who was hiding in her home. Um, he was he was also Jewish and he was he was captured and um, he had on him some papers which basically gave away the fact that you know where his his wife was hiding and so. So this much feared and dreaded raid by the Gestapo did take place, um, and the I will actually show you what I'm talking about. Um, my mother's house. Um, this raid took place, and um, the 
you know, fortunately, um, that although they were there for a piece of Gestapo men were there for several hours searching with a fine tooth comb. They actually didn't find any of the people who were hiding. The daughter of one of the um, uh, women who was, who was hiding in my mother's house was a 14 year old girl. She actually she, she became too many people to fit behind, you know, behind in a secret compartment in the wardrobe. So she actually was hiding behind this, um, behind this bookcase. There was, a, there was a small space behind these bookcases, which looked like they were built in, uh, but, but actually weren't. And she was behind there, and she had a bad cough. Uh, oh. About that particular um, day, it was, it was winter, and she had, she had a bad cough. And she was hiding behind there, standing absolutely still, not moving for hours, while these Gestapo men were just uh, sitting at this, at this dining table, whatever they can see. And, um, but but uh, they didn't find her. Um, they all survived the war. And did, did they? Uh, but they took my mother away because uh -huh. even though they didn't find anyone, so they didn't have any proof, there was no evidence. Nevertheless, they still suspected that she had been doing something, and so they took her away to this terrible place called the Hotel Majestic. Um, so the picture that I took of it, you know, back in the sort of the end of the 80s. So it was a very dilapidated building by then, but it was quite a, as the name implies, a majestic. Sort of well, hotel. the fantastic was a hotel yeah. up in uh, Schwabheim, yeah. in the hills of Buda, which was supposed to be a kind of um, summer holiday place for people of weak uh, lungs <laughs> or um, in need of um, being in the uh, in the hills and breathe proper uh, air, not the foul air of Budapest, which is, could be. Uh, rather nasty during the hot summers, and this was a kind of luxury hotel. Not Gestapo took it over and uh, turned it to a headquarter, and uh, a headquarter where they kind of took people to be interrogated and, and, and interrogated and tortured, and even tortured. That is where, for example, Bela Shalomon, the Hungarian cabaret artist, was taken, was Jewish, and. Uh, interrogated and said, uh, what's your name? Said, uh, Bela Shalomon. Your age? Said, I'll be 51. Will I be? <laughs> <laughs> and then in, in the end he was let off. But um, they were beating up people. They took uh, another famous chansonette, uh, Karadi Katalin, who was also helping Jews and uh, try to get away being engaged to the army uh, intelligence chief of the time, a uh, curious lady, but also a great talent. And uh, she was beaten up and, and, and uh, a very pretty woman and came out as a wreck afterwards from this one time luxury hotel, the Majestic, which wasn't that majestic after, after all in 1944. So Wally spent so some... So they, they took her there and she was there for about two weeks and they interrogated her and they tried to trip her up by, you know, with trick questions and, and all sorts of ways. And they put her into this big room which, which had lots and lots of people that were just packed into it. Um, they're mostly Jewish, I think. Um, and she got to know some of them pretty well. Um, but um, in the end, she was very, very lucky because um, this man, Paul Barabash, who was one of my mother's um, mentors, he was a film director, um, he directed her in a few films, um, but you know, they're also quite intimate, you know, like my mother, my mother's is very kind, she had a lot of lovers. If I stuff, remember you know. well, uh, uh, Peter only married the Valley after, after the, the war. war. Yes, absolutely. So, well, the yes, of she was a free woman. She was single. She was obviously very glamorous, and yeah, a lot of men were falling at her feet. Anyway, he was one of them, um, and he was unbeknownst to um, to uh, the Germans and the Hungarian police. He was working for the for the underground and the anti the anti Nazi resistance movement, and he very cleverly managed to get my mother out into um, and it was on the eve of that terrible day when they cleared the place out and took everyone else away and basically shot them all into the Danube 
and, and they almost all died. So she was sort of saved in the nick of time. By you mean the medicine. people who were in Majesty? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, they shot them into the Danube, wow. sort of one by one. Um, and um, so that was a, that was her first bit of very very good luck. I mean, she, my mother, seemed to in a way have a bit of a charm. Was she recognized by the state of Israel for this uh, what she's done? Well, that comes later in the story. All right, sorry. <laughs> later cut, on, cut, we're talking. Cut a long story short. Why <laughs> <laughs> um, cut it short? We can make it long. No. Um, so sorry. What was no, 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 no. That's interesting. Uh, so you say all the people who whom she was having, uh, uh, they all survived the war. Survived. Yeah. Yes. Um, they, yeah, I mean, what happened well, after this uh, this raid, and they, they took my mother away, um, they had to leave the house because it was then no longer safe for them to stay. So they had to somehow go out into the city and find other places to, other people to help them and other places to hide. And there was, at that point, there was only another month or two left before the Soviet army, of course, came and defeated the Germans. So there wasn't that much of the war left in Hungary. And by great luck, they all did manage to find you know, somewhere to, to stay. It's interesting. Uh, there are so many stories of how uh, certain individuals saved their lives. Um, some people were just going from one address to the other uh, with false papers. I mean, I just read uh, the memoirs of George Soros's father, who spent with his two teenage sons all day in the public bus, in the steam bus, because uh, the Germans didn't come in there and they didn't ask people for the papers. So they spent weeks and weeks and weeks in, 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 in the various public buses of uh, Budapest and then saved their lives. Uh, anyway, um, the Russians were coming uh, nearer and nearer, and unfortunately the Germans decided that they will defend Budapest instead of giving it up just like that. So uh, they blew up the bridges, the city was um, bombed to smithereens and looked terrible after the war. and. Um, then the Russians came in and they found uh, Vali's house uh, rather inviting. So uh, a billet, yeah. An, an army officer sort of uh, right. uh, requisited uh, half of the uh, building and set up his. Uh, yeah, this um, army officer here, um, the Red Army Colonel um, called Sasha, on the on the uh, right there, um, decided to make my mother's house um, his billet. And, um, you know, obviously they had a steamy little affair because, you know, my mother knows how to survive. And, you know, so that's, that was a, it was a good look. Was a good look. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't bad, he wasn't bad. Of course he had a wife back, back, oh. in, back in Russia, but I mean, yeah, you know. Far away. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, so they, that, was, that was all fine. Um, but then he was moved with his troops to another arena of the war. I think he was moved to Bulgaria. Anyway, he, he was moved out of Hungary um, with his troops for a while. And it was at, at that point that um, my mother's erstwhile um, sort of um, apparent friendship with the, with the Germans uh, really came back to be a big problem for her because um, once, the, once the Soviets um, you know, defeated the Germans and they were you know, then uh, ruling in, in Hungary and had the army there, um, all of the uh, sort of um, the, the communist, um, sort of underground communist um, partisans that had been mainly hiding in the forest outside Budapest suddenly came out of the woodwork or out of the forest. Anyway, they suddenly appeared, and my mother was one of the people. I mean, they're blood, they're really, really out for revenge, and you know what you can understand. But my mother was one of the people that they decided had been a collaborator because, well, you know, yes. she's been seen with them, you know, she was going out on dates with them and she was, you know, singing for them. And she, so basically, and, and also, why did they let her go just before they killed everyone in the Majestic? And well, it had to be because she was, she was collaborating. Um, so that was what they suspected her of. And um, I don't know why I'm telling you guys this because, you know, you should be reading this in my book, but never mind, I'll tell you anyway. There is a, a chapter 
about the Sasha affair in your book. Of course. Oh, good. Of course. Because I like romantic story. <laughs> but, uh, so, so what happened? The, okay. she, was, she was in a very uh, great fix because uh, she had to prove uh, that um, she wasn't a collaborator mm. after all. She had to prove that, but there was no way that she could. First of all, she had no idea where any of the people had gone who she had been hiding in her home. They had they disappeared in, into the city. You couldn't even get from Buddha to Pesh, and Pesh to Buddha, because the bridges were all down. There was no there was no communications, no telephone lines, I and mean, everything was destroyed. So there was no way she could contact anyone who could verify her story when she said, No, I wasn't a collaborator, I was actually helping my Jewish friends. But um, have some of them eventually testified. Oh eventually, yeah. I mean much much later. But what happened was, and this is her second hugely um, great stroke of luck. And the sort of thing that, you know, if you were writing a novel, people would just say, oh, come on, you know, that come on. But um, what actually did happen was that these, uh, this, this committee of, sort of Jewish ex, ex communist ex-partisans um, wanted to execute her. And they put her under house, and they wanted to put her, and they put her under house arrest so she couldn't leave. Um, and my mom was Catholic. So she basically, by that point, she was completely exhausted by the whole experience of the war and everything. And she basically, that was it. She kind of decided that she had to be reconciled with herself to her faith. And she got a priest in to give her the, to the last rites. And she was kneeling on the floor with the, with the priest there giving her the last rites when there was a thundering up the staircase and the door burst open and it's Sasha and he's back again through the test. Now come on, I mean if I made that up and put that in all the and go, yeah, right, you know, it doesn't happen, but actually that's what happened. And um, so he just looked at her again in the last question of the prison and said, Well, what's going on here? And she said there you know, she was always kind of like she explained it to me many, many years later, saying that she was almost like in a kind of daze, like it was almost she was already almost in another world. And she just said, They're they're going to shoot me tomorrow. Why are they going to shoot you? They think that I collaborated. Did you collaborate? No, of course not. I was hiding Jews, you know. Um, so basically, Sasha saved your life. And he just said, you know, you need to leave this woman alone. Yeah, Don't ever go near her again. She if you see my this in a film, that means you think that the, yeah. the script writer went a bit too far. <laughs> us, exactly. Make us believe that this can kind of. But I mean, when this when Red Army, a Red Army officer comes and says she's under my protection, you need to leave her alone. She's innocent. They just sort of scuttled away, and that was the end of them. So, so she, you know, again, she was very, very lucky. And um, there's a picture of. Sasha smiling and looking very heroic, obviously with bandaged head because he had got some injury uh, before he returned to Budapest. And um, with my mother's um, uncle, yes, that was her uncle there, um, who was visiting. So that's that picture. Uh, could she come back to the stage again after um, things settled? It was really, it was difficult because <coughs> You know, it wasn't very long before the communists got a fairly iron grip on Hungary. And then at that point, if you had been successful in that earlier era, um, you were a persona non grata. And yeah, I mean, she did a bit of singing here and there. Um, but to all intents and purposes, her career was pretty much winding down to a close because, you know, she married my father in 46. And then um, within a few years, my brother was born and I was born, and so, and then of course the whole revolution thing started kicking off. And, yeah. yeah. When did they get married, Peter and Molly? They got married in '46. '46. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's my parents on the roof terrace of my mother's house. I think probably in the year or two after they got married. Photographer. Well, they were the kind of um, successful young artists kind of uh, couple, and people didn't know how much difficulties they have to get along with the communists getting stronger and stronger. And uh, luckily, Peter was such a 
fast and um, imaginative writer, just a kind of um, brain who is good at writing scripts, film scripts. So he started uh, as a film a script writer and while he was busy with um, uh, the children, but um, also uh, here and there she could get little um, appearances, uh, radio jobs and you see the old ah, there they are, that's how I saw you. <coughs> and um, um, <coughs> on the other hand, they were not happy um, from 1948 onwards when the big change came and Hungary really became a Soviet type a dictatorship. Um, all her heroism was forgotten completely and, and, and uh, um, she was just not recognized as a as a star anymore. She was a fallen star somehow. Well, yeah, because, you know, it's a typical kind of, uh, in communist regimes, if you had come from, you know, you know, from a background where you've been like a factory worker or, you know, that sort of thing, then, then you could, you could um, be promoted and succeed. But if you come from a bourgeois background and, you know, my mother was associated with, with that kind of, you know, that kind of background, then of course you, Accepted, yeah, she, she, she could just, uh, couldn't just uh, be the drab working woman uh, with a kerchief and all that no. and, and, and drab clothes. She was always uh, outstandingly and um, shockingly elegant. Yes, she was uh, always very elegant. People asked, are you Hungarian? <laughs> she was asked once in the, in the city and said, yes, I, I am. I think her career was quite broken in two when well, she just emigrated to the West and then uh, she couldn't yeah. really find her uh, way back to what she was before. Well, no, because, well, we, you know, we went to America, we were a refugee family, two small kids and no money, so, I mean, she, at that point it was really just about survival. On the other hand, Peter became um, a radio journalist with Radio Free Rock pretty soon after. Yeah. They arrived and he had proper good wages, American pay, and, um, and, and he was again the brilliant um, reporter of uh, events and uh, writing of theater and film as well. Mm -hmm. And for a while you were in the States. Yep, we were in the States. Um, you had a good American accent for a while. Yeah, I still do, as people say. Yeah, some, some of it is left here. Um, yeah, we were there until 1970. And that's where I grew up, in, that, in New York. And then... Um, well, Radio Free Rock has its center in New York. In the United States, uh, yeah. It's a large broadcasting station in Munich. But also, Peter was a London correspondent. So yeah. he came to London. I remember you lived somewhere near Hyde Park. Yeah. Yes, in... Uh, a nice yes. block well, You know flats. my mother, she was going to live in, uh, you know. I was once invited, and <coughs> your mother made a real proper Hungarian goulash, the way it's supposed to be a goulash soup. Yeah. And the little 18 year old, or I don't know how old are you, uh, Monica was singing oh. Hungarian folk songs <laughs> to entertain the the dinner guests yeah, and show so that sorry. she's got talent as well. So please go home and say that Monica is just as talented uh, as her mother is. Well, yeah, I mean, to finish off her, her uh, wartime story... Um, she was a beautiful old lady, uh, a little bit uh, leaning on a stick and very grey. Yeah, I mean, she was, yeah. It wasn't that she was in her 80s that she, her health started failing a bit, but... Um, and occasionally when uh, she had a good sort of period in her life, she was uh, letting people, asking her to come and sing to us and uh, entertain us. We are just a, a small club of Hungarians uh, here in London or in Munich or wherever, in New York. Could you... Uh, 
sing a few old chansons to us with your own piano accompaniment because she was playing the piano quite well. Of course. And, uh, and she did uh, that even at the age of eight, yes. Yeah. yeah, she did that a lot. Well, in the, I mean, in America, in the, in the 60s, she would give really big, you know, con I mean, she would be part of big, big shows, variety shows, yeah. Hungarian emigres. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of Hungarian emigres all over America, so she, she did that quite a lot. I mean, that was one thing that, in one way, which she did, you know, as a work, keep her hand in, in the show business. Funny that everybody knew who was Wally Rats. Yeah, of course. And uh, so after all, how was this that in the end her um, uh, save, saving of the Jews was well, I, recognized? Well, I wrote a book about my mother's wartime exploits, um, which was published in 1990. And um, this was the first time that her whole story actually came to light so publicly because my mother never, never talked about it. Very, very few people knew. I mean, I hardly knew anything about it myself. But anyway, I managed to, to you know, get all the sort of details of her story from her and also quite a few of the people who were involved in her story were still alive then, so I could also talk to them at length and sort of basically go to the horse's mouth to get to get the, the story out. Um, and I published a book about it and then um, one of the people that I sent it to was Simon Wiesenthal, and um, he passed it on to Yad Vashem, mm -hmm. and with the recommendation that they, they read the story because you know he felt that she was someone who was worthy of their attention. And um, then what happened was the whole process of verification began, and that's the point at which um, the descendants of some of the people who she saved, including and one of the one of the ladies who was Still alive. Um, only, yeah, okay, only this little thing. You only write in English, but I remember your first book was all about visiting back to Hungary yeah. after so many years. Yeah. But you seem to be fascinated by the actual discovery of your uh, first place mm -hmm. and with all its uh, warts and then faults, and then uh, it wasn't that happy there, but uh, it was before the big change. Which year was it? In 1970-something? When I first went back? Yes. Well, the early 70s. It was the late 80s when I decided to write my mother's story. Um, and anyway, the, the fact that her story finally came to light and it was brought to the attention of Yad Vashem, where they, they honor the, um, the uh, saviors of Jews. Um, and so they, they um, gave her this um, title of Righteous Among the Nations. Um, and my mother and I went to Israel together to Jerusalem uh, to the Yad Vashem for this ceremony um, where they unveiled the plaque to her and um, so that is us there and it's 1992 when that happened. It's so me and my mother, as I said, one of the, the ladies who's hiding there and the, the, the man next to her is the son of the married couple that was hiding my mother's side. Nice. The Mundells were, they're quite an Orthodox Jewish couple. That my, my mother knew them because they ran the store that my mother would often go to in Budapest, and so she knew them. And um, they uh, they also emigrated to Israel after the war, sometime in the fifties. And so that is their son. And here um, is the son's son. So this is the this is the third generation. And the son also at that point was married with two little girls. So this is the family that exists. My mother saved the parents. Now, what is happening to that um, little memorial room in the in school? Gölle. God knows. I haven't been there for, I haven't been there for a while. Mayor of Gölle is still okay. fighting. Yes. You know what village disputes? Do they I ever see. get resolved? No, I think they're still fighting over what was going to happen with this thing. Now, both of them, your father and mother, lived long. You know, very importantly to me, she lived long enough to see that she was honored for what she did during the war because it took, you know, half a century before she was recognized for doing what she had done. And I, the fact that it came about as a result of a book that I wrote is something that I'm very proud of and it's probably the, the thing I'm proudest of most of all in, in my whole career. Egy Csak egy 
Yeah. 